I'm Liza Mundy, the director of the Breadwinning and Caregiving Program at New America. For those of you who are new to New America, it's a think tank that's much more than a think tank. New America is an organization committed to the renewal of American politics, prosperity, and purpose in the digital age. We're simultaneously a tech technology laboratory, a media platform, and a public forum. Indeed, this event today is part of our commitment to providing a platform and forum to enable collaboration among the public, private, and civic sectors in order to find solutions to some of our most difficult public problems. The Breadwinning and Caregiving Program, which I direct, reframes the conversation about work, family, and gender issues at a pivotal time in our nation's discourse. We tackle issues around women's leadership, work-family balance, changing gender roles, caregiving, and today, violence against women. The Violence Against Women Act is a critical piece of legislation that has had huge impact on the lives of women in America and on the growth of organizations dedicated to working in communities to end domestic violence. VAWA must be reauthorized every five years, and each time it has grown more inclusive and responsive. For example, in 2013, policymakers added a provision to give tribal nations the right to prosecute non-tribal members who abuse women on tribal land. The LGBTQ community also successfully secured additions to the act, for instance, making it illegal to turn away someone from a shelter based on their gender identity or sexual orientation. But as we approach the reauthorization of the act in 2018, it's clear that there's still much that policymakers can do to improve on this progress, learn from past successes, and ultimately create an act that better responds to the needs of immigrant women of color, a rapidly growing population in this country. Today, I'm very pleased to welcome representatives from South Asian women's organizations from across the country to discuss how the Violence Against Women Act has both supported and ignored survivors of domestic violence from their communities, and to explore how an updated version of VAWA might better serve them. Given that Asian Americans have recently overtaken Latinos as the greatest as the largest new group of immigrants to the United States, it's increasingly important to consider how this community should be addressed in U.S. policy making at large, even beyond the VAWA authorization in 2018. With that, I'm very happy to introduce the moderator of today's conversation, Tiloma Jayasinghe, who is the former executive director of Saki, a nonprofit that works to end violence against women in South Asian communities. She has also worked for the United Nations Division for the Advancement of Women and as a staff attorney for the National Advocates for Pregnant Women. Please welcome Taloma, who will introduce the rest of our terrific panelists today. I'll also mention that the event is being streamed and it will be podcast. And if you'd like to tweet, you can tweet at the hashtag VAWA for all, which is an F4 is spelled out, F O R. Thanks so much. Welcome. Thank you. Oh, good. I'm mic'd. I don't need to go to the podium. Um, I wanted this to be more of a conversation, um, and so I'm going to be seated here the entire time. So, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming at the the coffee hour and for being awake and alert, I see. <laughs> um, I'm so glad we're all gathered here to kick off a week's long work of, worth of activities, I think, around the White House initiatives, API Summit and API Heritage Month. API stands for Asian and Pacific Islander communities, to those of us who don't know. Um, and we're kicking it off with a panel focused on gender. So I really want to thank New America Foundation for hosting us and being so welcoming and supportive of these critical conversations, you know, as we come to a uh, a deeper understanding of how uh, the changing demographics of the U.S. you know will shift conversations and, and power. So um, I'm going to start off with a lot of introductions because I'm going to introduce our panelists, and I'm also going to introduce the community a little bit. So um, in the middle, this I wrote notes in without knowing how we'd be seated. So in the middle <laughs> is Manju Kulkarni, who's the executive director of the South Asian Network in California. She has dedicated her career to the public interest. Um, she was a senior attorney at NHELP, and uh, she's received numerous accolades uh, for her public service. Um, from the South Asian Bar Association, she was also a Women's Policy Institute Fellow as part of the project of the Women's Foundation of California, and she's just a wonderful person, a brilliant advocate, and um, we're so happy to have her here. And she took a red eye, and so she's awake, which is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, to her left, 
a little dyslexic, is Aparna Bhattacharya. Uh, she's the executive director of Raksha, which is another South Asian women's organization, which is based in Georgia. Um, and she's been uh, active in the movement and gender-based violence since she could talk, it seems. Um, she's been the executive director <laughs> since 1998. Yep. And uh, she's also on the board of the Georgia Coalition Against Domestic Violence. She, too, is, has received numerous accolades, um, including the White House Champion of Change for her extraordinary work in inspiring and empowering her community, which is, you know, she, she so richly deserves. Um, if you want to know more about our panelists, you should go online. I'm giving the succinct version because they are just brilliant, brilliant people and advocates. And to my left is Sharon Staple, not a South Asian woman. <laughs> um, she is the executive director of the New York City Anti-Violence Project, which is dedicated, which is the largest organization dedicated to ending hate violence, sexual violence, and domestic violence affecting LGBTQ and HIV affected communities. She began her career as a staff attorney, and actually, I didn't know this, you created Legal Aid's first dedicated DV project. Mm -hmm. She's so brilliant. <laughs> and in and, and any of her roles, whether it's being an adjunct professor at CUNY Law or Hunter, or on committees advising the NYPD or even national task forces, she is a champion for the LGBTQ community and for similarly placed communities on the margins of national policy. Um, we, we'll have another panelist coming. She's trying to be um, two people at once. Uh, Shilpa Padke, she's the senior director of the Women's Initiative, the Center of American Progress, and so she's going to join us later. Um, her focus on, of work is on economic security, on work, family balance, and pay equity, and women's leadership. And prior to that, she was with the White House as a uh, special assistant to the president for cabinet affairs. And she's an accomplished policy advisor and strategist. And you know, being that accomplished, she's, she, has, she gets invited to many places, but she's going to make it here. So we'll mic her up, and she'll join us later on in the conversation. Um, so as I give introductions, I want to also introduce this, uh, who we are. So South Asians um, are now 4.2 million of us in the US. Indians are the largest, 80% followed by Pakistanis, Bangladeshis, Nepalis, and Sri Lankans. But there are more that make up this community, Bhutanese, um, uh, Indo-Americans, oh, sorry, Indo-Caribbeans who live in the West Indies. And so there's, we're a large community, and we're growing. And so as was alluded earlier, um, the growth rate for the South Asian population is exceeding that of the Asian Pacific Islander community. And also, uh, for perspective, it's now increasing the Hispanic, uh, exceeding that of the Hispanic population. And I got all these lovely citations from SALT, South Asian Americans Leading Together. Um, they're right based here in D they're a national organization, but they're based in DC. So they give you all the facts you need to know about our community. And um, Aparna and Manju are executive directors of South Asian women's organizations. And we call ourselves, and Saki is one of those two. South SAWOS is the acronym. And there are, about, there are more than 30 of us across the US. We're in, in nearly every state. And we are about 30. Some of us are thir like 35 years old, and some of us are pretty new. But we work in our communities. We're the only organizations in our community that have a gender lens explicitly. And we've all been formed around domestic, you know, to combat domestic violence in our communities. But we've grown to address broader needs because if there's a, gen a question of gender and how it interplays in our community, we usually step up to the plate. So we've been around for a while, and we're trying to grow our power as representatives of women and girls in our community, and also trying to work in allyship, because we work locally in our community. We provide services. Saki's based in New York. We have helplines, but we also realize that we, we're, we're a strong coalition, and we're trying to build that power. So our conversation today will start off with VAWA, but it's not the end and whole of our conversation as we talk about what does it mean to build community power and be the new Americans and also uh, address our community's needs uh, from a national perspective. Um, I also want to allude to we couldn't do our work because we're so small without working in partnership and in allyship with strong allies. Um, Sharon and I have worked together in New York. I, one time she asked me to participate on a uh, what was it? it? Was Vera Institute for Justice, and uh, as a mainstream organization, and for <laughs> little South Asian women's organization to be perceived of as mainstream, <laughs> I was very, I was like, woo! And now she's the uh, token non-South Asian on the panel. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, we we work with our respective communities, and we see the parallels between when you work on the margins, how you're trying to build it more into the center. So you know, um, she's part of that coalition of trying to talk about unpopular issues in our community and bring it more to the forefront of whenever we talk about what uh, it means to progress in our community. OK, so uh, enough with introductions. And now let's get into the meat of why you are all here. So as we grow our power, how do we build more towards gender justice issues in our community? 
So what I alluded to earlier was like one good test of how a community grows is how present you are at the table when big things get discussed. So you know, uh, we'd like to move towards being present at the next reauthorization for the Violence Against Women Act, VAWA, which gets reauthorized every five years. And it's next up in 2018. That would be a good indicator of how we've you know, muscled up a little bit more than what we are now and to speak with one national voice. Um, but it is not the whole or the sum of what our community needs. It is the starting point of our conversation tonight. And my first question, I'm hoping panelists, I know they're, both, they're all chatterboxes, so I'm going to try not to lead too much, but I will have some questions if we just kind of um, start rambling. So my first question is to Aparna. Um, to, you know, you've been in this movement for a long time. And um, how has VAWA, like what had, what had VAWA done for our community, both in terms of addressing you know, domestic violence issues, but also how it built, helped build yeah. you know, this community? I think one thing is, um, you know, in VAWA 2005, well, number one, Violence Against Women Act, um, self-petitions, creating self-petitions, which is a form of immigration relief for survivors who are married to citizens or green card holders was one of the big things that has helped our community because a lot of times immigration is a huge issue. We'd have a lot of survivors who are married to green cards and citizens and they would not apply for them and use immigration as a tool of abuse. So that's one thing the original VAWA gave us, right? Was a, a way for us to apply for many survivors. Um, in VAWA 2005, they added a provision which um, added an opportunity or a form of relief or work authorization for South Asian survivors. So in a way, it was there, and they included that aspect, but we still don't have a way to apply for that, which is a later conversation. The other thing is funding. We've gotten a lot of funding. A lot of SAWOs have gotten funding to be able to support our work and grow. And as many of us are in the room, that we've been able to get some of the culturally specific funding to support our domestic violence and sexual violence work. So that's helped us grow. Whether it's at the state level or at the national level, it's helped us grow our programs. It's helped us have a stronger voice. So it's been important in incre increasing, number one, access for survivors who have immigration issues, but also increasing funding for our organizations to grow. I'm trying to keep it short and simple. Oh. If you, unless you I'm want me to so say sorry. more. <laughs> pray, pray. Well, okay, well, Manju, um, well, Aparna and Manju, but Manju, do you want to take a first crack at, like, Babo has been critical in helping us grow and addressing some of the particular needs that survivors of violence from our community face. Um, but there are, despite these huge strides and every authorization that's expanded its protections, but how have been some of the, the gaps? What are some of the gaps that still exist today for the, the women we work with? Sure, thank you. Um, so I would say one of the main gaps that our community faces um, as a result of um, the limitations of VAWA is really, um, I think, the focus on law enforcement and law enforcement as um, a necessity in terms of moving forward on U visas, for example. U visas require reporting to law enforcement, and that's just difficult for a lot of women in our community. There's fear of deportation, for both themselves as well as their spouses. There have been a number of cases, not just in the South Asian community, where women have called the police um, and under the federal secure communities have themselves been deported just by calling the police and then being included in some of the federal databases. Um, there's also, of course, fears because the battering spouse is the breadwinner. And so if you call the police and your husband um, is put in prison, then where are you going to get any money to feed your family? It takes many months often for individuals to get public benefits. Um, and in some of our states, there are not, no public benefits even to be had. If you look in the healthcare realm and some of the food stamps and um, uh, other public benefits. Additionally, because of over surveillance of the Muslim community, we see a lot of concerns um, about reporting because um, people already are living in fear um, of law enforcement. Um, and the last one I'll mention is just also um, in terms of what is required um, of reporting, which is showing the, um, that there's proof of a bona fide marriage. And in some cases, in immigrant families, that's actually very difficult. If you are married back in the homeland and um, say your husband um, has all the bank accounts in his name, he has um, all the, um, the, the land, the mortgages, the apartment leases, whatever it is, um, if they're all in his name, there's 
almost nothing for women to show that they're actually um, in a marriage, and so that becomes difficult. Um, one other thing I want to mention too, though, is a limitation when you only look at law enforcement is then is law enforcement fully prepared to deal with our community? And in a lot of situations, they just frankly are not. There's very, very limited cultural competency. There's at least in California, very uh, limited use of the language line. And so when you're talking about women who are ling limited English speakers, they don't have any way of communicating what's happened to them. And they often get co-opted um, because the husband can actually speak English. Uh, and then finally, if they go through the court system, are there interpreters available? And how strong are their interpretation skills? We actually had a client. Um, who knew the interpreter. He was sort of an older uncle in the community. Um, and he knew the perpetrator and was friends with the perpetrator. And so, of course, when he's interpreting in the court, um, he uses all language that would be favorable to the perpetrator and language that's not favorable or even understood by her. So, for example, he said, um, you know, in Hindi, do you have a restraining order using the English you know, word restraining order? And she doesn't know what a restraining order is, so she said yes. And that actually wasn't even true, and so it detrimentally affected her case. So I would say these are the gaps that still need to be filled after VAWA. Yeah, and from what I understand, in 2013, a lot of the immigration provisions were not addressed that needed to be addressed, and they were put off for immigration reform, and we haven't had you know, a lot of any of the immigration um, reform or any of the immigration laws pass. And so, there's a lot of immigrant stuff that we needed to work on that was not addressed in VAWA 2013. So increasing the numbers of U visas. If anybody knows anything about U visas, which is the crime victim visa, we don't. We are already in 2016 fiscal year numbers. And what happens is you can get approved to get a U visa, but in that time you're in a, you're in deferred action. So until your priority date comes up, which would be in 2016 or maybe even 2017 if you get it, then what do you do? You're in this kind of state of flux and. I'm from the South, and so we have a lot of anti-immigrant laws. <laughs> and so what happens is our legislator tries to pass laws that says that if you're in deferred action, we don't want you to get a driver's license because they're thinking you're going after all the DACA students, but there's actually victims of domestic and sexual violence who would be impacted in not being able to get a driver's license. And so luckily that didn't pass because we didn't do a lot of advocacy at the state level, but people are trying to pass a lot of anti-immigrant laws that would impact a lot of survivors. And so with having to wait two to three years just to get a U visa, it's, it's daunting. And then how do you support yourself? The wait time to even get approved for the visa can be about a year. So imagine being undocumented, not being able to support yourself. You're only in shelter for what, three to six months if you're lucky? How do you survive? You have no source of income to support yourself. So then you become vulnerable to victimization by potential employers or community members who know that situation. So it's not working for our communities. And it, it's not just folks on U visas, because a lot of survivors who are on H-4 visas, which a lot of South Asians are on, which is a dependent spouse of an H-1B worker, they're not allowed to work either. They're legally in this country. They have permission to be here. But if they're a victim of domestic violence, they don't have access to supporting themselves and their children. And they're in this very precarious situation. And so part of, you know, again, my frustration is this law passed in 2005 where age four survivors were supposed to get some type of path to apply for a temporary work authorization. Well, we still don't have that on the books yet. Ten years later, nothing has been, there's not a, a way to apply for this relief. And so that's an important piece that I think there's still a gap where certain survivors are not having access. The other piece about U visas is it's discretionary. So that means a department in one county can sign off, but if this department in the county right next to it doesn't, it's not equal access to this relief. So some communities, depending on their government and their officials, can access it and some can't. And to me, that's really unfair that we have to rely on the discretion and the whims of certain politicians to, to access this special relief for victims of crime. And to me, that's not good. <laughs> not good so at all. So you're highlighting how doing work on gender-based violence, so you, people think it's interpersonal, you're talking about you know, shelter and stuff. It really, in our community, involves working on a lot of immigration issues. Yes. So you, we have to sit in what would be, if we were siloed, 
different movements, right? right? So immigration reform is going on one path, right. VAWA's on another, but you have to sit on both. Right. And at the same time, our struggles are not just our own. Right. A lot of what you were saying about over-policing and, and, and lack of cultural competency, I feel resonates a lot with other communities. And I think with Sharon, with, your, with the LGBTQ community, what they've, it's another similarly over-policed uh, community. Is that resonating with you as well? And is that kind of a little bit of, did, was that one of the motivating factors for kind of We'll get there in later conversation, but like why you decided to um, build towards making sure VABA was inclusive of your community, or was it just that was not the primary thing? I'm not sure that was the primary thing, but yes, absolutely, that those things resonated. I, in fact, I wrote them down because <laughs> mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, we have the same. You know, I think we're talking about marginalized communities generally and what their engagement with law enforcement is, but I also think we're talking about intersecting communities, yeah. right? Because there are South Asian queer communities yes. as well, right? <laughs> Um, <clears throat> and I think really what motivated us to, well, what motivated us to think about getting involved with VAWA was basically what you laid out in terms of what VAWA meant for the movement in terms of the relief, the remedies, the funding, the ability to provide services. And we'll talk about this, I think, a little bit later. It, it turned into something that was sort of much greater than that and, and uh, much more complex than that in terms of the strategy and going about it. But certainly I think some of the some of the themes I'm hearing here, which is there are a lot of intersections, there are a lot of ways that we need to be in different worlds in order to be able to move work forward, um, was a, a is a resonant uh, sort of the theme for the, w the way we got into the work as well. Um, thank you. Just to shift a little bit, Manju, when you were preparing for this panel, Manju actually had mentioned that, um, what is the line that you said? Um, it takes more than lawmaking to build community power. And so I think um, we've talked a lot about VAWA, like as one particular law. Mm -hmm. But yet, um, as representatives of a growing community, and a community that still doesn't always put gender issues at the forefront, we're working even within our community to make sure that there is awareness of how, if you're working towards immigration reform, that you don't forget the gendered aspect of it. When you're working on economic security, that you don't forget the gendered aspect of it. When you're working on a whole host of issues that you know we have to step up to the plate. And what have you learned by that? Like, what did you mean when you said that? Like, what would it take? Um, well, one thing I think what I was primarily thinking about when I said that was um, the changes that we need to see in our community culturally. So I want to just um, give an example of that. Um, and a client of ours who actually in some ways has been aided by, by VAWA has in fact been abandoned in other ways by the community. So um, this is a young Bangladeshi mother who called the police when um, her husband was um, um, beating her and the police came, they took him away. Uh, and then she was left in an apartment complex with a lot of um, single men who were interested in her. She was a very attractive young woman. She felt nervous about her own safety when she told members of the community, whether they were religious leaders or even her physician, one, every single person said, you should not have called the police. Even, you know, literally, you, it may cause your death, but you should not call the police. And so when you have a community that's saying that to you, then of course you have self-doubts and you wonder like, oh, maybe I shouldn't. And then your kids, you know, also are, you know, where is dad? Um, they have um, their own issues and concerns. And so I think for us at San, what we've tried to do then is really to talk about this in that, um, in terms of framing an appropriate community response. And so, um, some of the uh, tactics or strategies we've used are actually to even start earlier. Talk about sun preference in the community. What does that mean? That's something that in the South Asian community we see quite a bit. What are the ramifications of that? Then we talk about um, with uh, college age women um, in Los Angeles, sexual assault in the community, um, and also their reproductivity. Um, when we've had those workshops, um, almost every single woman has said to us, all my parents care about is getting married. And so when you're in an environment where the parents only are concerned about that, of course you're gonna have many women who then 
are either in forced marriage situations or in situations where they're married to batterers because the only important thing is to be married and then to have children, right? So then we get into the issue of reproductive justice. So for us, it's really a much bigger issue than it is about lawmaking. It's about changing the way our community looks at gender and the way that we as women, because we are a woman, uh, women-led organization and um, women-staffed organization really thinking about how um, we want to instill progressive values around gender within the community and within all the work that we do. How do you address, so it's, how do you talk about unpopular issues in our community? Like how do you do that? You're saying like, okay, we got to talk to community. Right. And, and we as workers, in, even as workers of our organizations get stigmatized for doing this work. Mm -hmm. So how do you talk about the unpopular issue? Like the South Asian community, the API community in general, is this quote unquote at one point model minority and, and we're talking about the dark underbelly of it. So how do you go right. out and, and this is open to all of the panelists because all of you are addressing the unpopular issues in your communities. Um, but you can start. Well, how, sure. What does that mean? So we've done a couple of different things. So we have done, um, you know, we've used opportunities um, either that have come through, um, you know, events that have happened around the world. For example, the series of workshops we did for um, college age women came after the um, gang rape that happened in Delhi um, in 2012, um, or yeah, 2012. And then um, we've had conversations about sun preference with um, you know, women who are my age, who are mothers, who are in their late 30s or early 40s. Um, so a number of these conversations we've started with are with women themselves. We actually had a fabulous conversation that even involved talking about um, romantic relationships and sex with older women, with women who were caregivers in our community. And they were surprisingly really honest about their own relationships and what they had been told about um, sex by their own mothers and by other women in the community. So that's one avenue. The other avenue is actually using our work in health and civil rights to have those conversations. Um, and um, I'll just share with you one example, which was a, in an individual conversation, is when we went out to do um, Obamacare outreach, um, as we're an uh, outreach and enrollment entity in California, um, our staff member was literally knocking on doors in little Bangladesh. And when she saw one door we, um, we knocked on, a woman said, you know, I have a lot going on. And that was essentially code for domestic violence. And so here we had an entree using health um, as a way to get in. And actually, in other cases very similar to that, we have had couples come in to get enrolled in healthcare. And because our staff is so well trained, they know when they see it. And so have been able to call those women afterwards and say, you know, is something going on? Is there something you want to talk about? Um, but we also have used it when we go out to mosques, to um, temples and gurdwaras. When we talk about health, we also talk about sexual assault and domestic violence. When we go out to talk about citizenship and try to enroll people in our citizenship clinics, we mention it. And we use every opportunity that we have in those sort of benign realms to talk about um, gender violence. And um, you'd be surprised how many people open up um, and sometimes come to us under the guise of something else. And really what they're coming for is help with um, domestic violence. And I think that's the benefit of your organization because it's South Asian Network. There's not a stigma. They could, any, anybody could come to you for any reason without worrying about the stigma of, oh, they see me coming to San. Right. Do they, you know what I mean? Whereas it, it, it's a different, I think it's a little bit different than some of the other organizations right. where like, you know, sometimes if we have a booth, we have to kind of step away so people can get the information and not feel like folks are being watched or people are stereotyping and you know because I think like many communities we're a small but big community and people will find out and they notice and they'll know your business and they'll agree so I think that's something to keep in mind and I know when we started we did a lot of immigration workshops and that's how we got people to the table so you would talk about immigration then you would talk about immigration relief for folks who are victims of domestic violence so you'd weave it in and you find those ways to, to kind of talk about it and I think for
for us being in the South, like being in Georgia, we're the only organization that does the work that we do. So we kind of have to keep an open uh, framework of being able to address multiple issues that intersect our community and that's how we get kind of access to our community. So if it's talking about victim compensation because there's been a number of um, home invasions in Georgia, we would go in and at least talk about that and that way the community sees us and sees us as a resource to where they could come and talk about the other issues impacting them because talking about domestic and sexual violence, at least in the beginning, I mean, we're in a much better place now, but in the beginning it was really difficult and people just didn't want that associated with our community. It was too difficult and too hard to talk about. So you have to have kind of the kind of safer areas where you can intersect and create that space to have those conversations so people can approach it, which is why we've got to be in the community a lot more. Um, welcome. Thank so you. <laughs> anyway, apologies. Um, I just wanted to, so community is broader than our community. I mean, we are. Very diverse. And, but our community is more than just the South Asian community. Yeah. Like you have been, like I think when they see you coming in Georgia, they know that you are, <laughs> you're, like you are the voice of not just in the South Asian community, yeah. but of the domestic violence issue when you're with organizations or government officials not talking about the South Asian community or domestic violence. Right. Like your, our community is broader than that. And I feel like you've been in, in different shoes that you've sat, you know, different guises you've had, Either you're bringing up, oh, don't forget the South Asians, or in other, other movements, don't forget the Immigrant domestic violence yeah. survivors, exactly. right? Yeah. So how have you navigated that? Because I think, I, I think a lot of times when you have to fight to have your voices heard, um, you, you can't rely on other people just speaking yeah. for you. So you've spoken, like when I mean community, can you uplift that a little bit and talk about yeah, that there's many sense. communities we yes, have. So yeah. like, in, you know, being on the Georgia Coalition Against Domestic Violence, like having to remind them about immigrant issues. So like the deferred action and driver's license issue that we face in Georgia as a domestic violence organization, they're not going to think about that impact on immigrant survivors. So I'm not just going in for South Asians, I'm going in for any immigrant <laughs> survivor or even the students who are, you know, the DACA students, the deferred action for childhood arrivals. It's like if we have policies like this, we're putting so many people in danger and uh, using the domestic violence lens is a way that we can, I guess, build more allyship to make sure these negative policies don't impact the larger immigrant community overall. So in that realm, I'm always reminding, and then in the, of course in the immigrant, <laughs> when we're doing immigrant-related advocacy work, I'm always bringing up the, the, the gender lens and trying to make sure. So our communities are multiple, right? There's South Asian community, but then there's the state of Georgia and reminding our state of the impact of anti-immigrant laws and how it impacts us, but then tying in the domestic violence and the immigrants. So there's many multiple hats that I have to wear, but it's just to make sure that the unintended consequences don't impact a larger group. I don't know if I... No, no thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so we were talking about... Um, what were we talking about? Talking to our community. <laughs> uh, and actually, this conversation originally started with taking more than lawmaking to build power. And so, like, what does it take to build that power? And how we can learn from allied movements. And so, did you want to add something, Aparna? I did, because I think well, part of what I want to talk was the H4, the H4 um, issue a little bit more. Of like, while we have a lot of advocacy going on around immigration, and we did a lot, we were really great in getting the U visa regs out pretty quickly because it impacted all undocumented um, immigrant communities. But with the H4 provision, it's still, we're still waiting on it. And part of that is, most, when I've been in even larger Asian forums, people have forgotten about this provision because it doesn't impact the larger API community. It just impacts the South Asian community. So even within our own API immigrant community, I have to remind people about this legislation. And lawyers will be like, really? Do we have that? And I'm like, yes, we do. It's been on there for, for a while. So even within our own realms, reminding the folks about the South Asian community, because the larger API community, it's, this is not an important issue. They don't see it as an urgency because they don't deal with this, but yet the South Asian community voices have to deal with it quite a bit. So having to be that nag in the room about this one provision, but the thing is nothing, it's still kind of stagnant. I mean, I know they made one more step and they had regulations, but you know, they still have forgotten about this and we're still having to remind people that we're still waiting for something. What's been your experience about talking about an unpopular issue <laughs> in your community? Well, I, timing is everything, right? So um, we decided to look at LGBT folks' inclusion in the Violence Against Women Act sometime in 2008, 2009, um, when all anybody wanted to talk about was marriage, right? So we were 
the folks that were like, yeah, marriage is awesome um, if you want to be married, but there's also this intimate partner violence thing going on and we need to, sexual violence, we need to address it. And so um, the timing sucked for the conversation, right? Like we, nobody wanted to talk about domestic violence while we were talking about why we should get married just like straight people and we're just as good as straight people and we're, um, you know, we have the station wagons and the dogs and we don't beat each other, you know, kind of thing. So that was really, yeah. really difficult. And I think it's really difficult just generally um, to talk to communities about the vi interpersonal violence, right? And I mean, to this day, I still have LGBT folks tell me that it, domestic violence doesn't exist in LGBT communities because we're so um, persecuted as a community. <laughs> like, why would we beat each other up, you know? And that makes some degree of logic, but it's really, really difficult to sort of uh, get past those ideas. And so I think um, framing is so critical, and I think what you all are talking about in terms of like, how do you talk about it as a health issue? How do you talk about it as a civil rights issue? For us, talking about it as a non-discrimination issue was really helpful because people could talk about marriage and talk about non-discrimination in the same sentence, right? And so that was something that we could really get entree into. But I'll be honest with you, we were not, you know, I, I, I joked that for, you know, two or three years, I couldn't get invited to the opening of an envelope, right? Because everything was about marriage and I was yeah. like beating the like, well, no pun intended. Oh, no, <laughs> no, no. no. <laughs> I, you know, I, I was the one talking about intimate partner or sexual violence. And so I do think you have to be creative. I do think you have to think what are folks' motivations? What are their interests? And how can we get them in a room to talk about it? And as soon as you're in the room, you know, you know what the issues are. and, and you can start to build community to try and figure out what some of the solutions are, VAWA being one, but, but not necessarily all. So um, I want to bring in Shilpa and just to update. So we were talking about how, as you can hear, if you talk about the issue, you can't forget the community. If you talk about the community, you can't forget about an issue. So as you work on economic security and justice issues, how do you bring in a gender lens? Like what's have been your experience as you know, a related movement for social justice and not forgetting that you got to include gender. Yeah. I think the most important thing, well, there's, there's two pieces of it, right? And as we think about the, the violence angle, I think, especially in our community, the question is, how do you, what do those conversations look like? But even more importantly, how do you get people to have those conversations, mm -hmm. right? So I think that piece about just getting in the room and starting the conversation, and maybe it doesn't go where you want, but at least you're starting a level of awareness of an issue. Um, and I find a, you know, a way to do that across kind of progressive movements is really storytelling. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think often, you know, I think about a conversation I would have with my parents. We would never talk about domestic abuse, right? It's just such a topic that is so um, uncomfortable for them. But if you happen to mention, oh, you read this, you read this article or a friend of a friend, or then all of a sudden it becomes a little bit more personal and real. And so I think across kind of issue areas, the power of stories and personalization um, tend to help. And I think that's kind of one of the hardest things. But I think in a lot of these spaces with this community, our community, the challenge is just getting people comfortable about issues that they're not comfortable with. And that um, level of awareness, I think, is really challenging. And, and to get them, let alone to get them politically motivated to do something about it. Do you find the same things that we do, uh, we meaning people, organizations that work on gender specifically, like violence against women, but also the broader gender justice stuff? For us to, I feel like we're always saying, don't forget about women in anything. And where you're sitting, where your main focus is on economic justice, but in, as part of like the women's initiative, right? Is it easier in different conversations? Or is, is it because violence is so stigmatized in our, in I, our community, it's harder. Part of it. I mean, I think there's different parts. So our work at CAP is really focused around you know, working family economic issues, so affordable child care and paid leave and sick days, um, which are things that most people, you know, can sort of attest to are good things that, especially if they've lived in other parts of the world, you know, this, the system we have here seems challenging. But some of the same kind of stigmas exist, right? Which is, what do you mean you're going to go back to work? Mm -hmm. Right, as, as, an, as an underlier, I think, in the community as opposed to, you know, of course you'll stay home with your child. But I think, you know, something that would be interesting to kind of think through is how these perceptions are changing and, and what kind of um, AAPI or South Asian millennial views are on some of these issues. 
and, and how that you know, could be another bridge as we talk about conversations. You know, one of the things I think we learned a lot in the healthcare debate was um, children asking their parents about healthcare. Do you know? You know, and, and it'd be interesting to see kind of the intergenerational piece on some of these issues and, and how that could kind of introduce the, the stories. One thing, um, Deloma, if I could um, add too, is that uh, I think it's important that the focus um, not only be on physical violence, but also on um, other forms of you know, gender violence. And I think that's something that we try to do at SAN um, through these conversations, um, sometimes about other things. Um, and I'll just bring up two examples. Uh, one, you know, that we see regularly in domestic violence situations is, um, you know, financial or economic control um, or domination even, right? And we had a client, uh, a couple that came in for citizenship and the husband would hold all the documents. He would never let his wife touch anything. And so we knew that in that situation that there was more going on, right? Now, there may not have been physical violence, but there was something, you know, there was um, uh, a strong amount of control. And so we trained our staff member to be able to, um, to shift that dynamic a little bit just in the using citizenship. So for example, we had her say, oh, uncle, I know that you're very, very good at this and you have everything, but you know, you're not going to be in the uh, interview when your wife is there, so you need to give her the documents. And for right now, you have to be quiet. And I'm going to ask her all of the questions and you can't say anything. And so then it's just in like small conversations like that. There was another example too in the healthcare context with Obamacare where um, a husband was being very loud and abusive to his wife and our staff member said to him, look, I will not allow you to talk to her that way in my presence. And, and he was very surprised. She actually, there were tears that came out of her eyes because nobody had ever, and she said that to us later, nobody had ever stood up for her. So I think it's important that while we're often focusing on domestic violence as it pertains to physical violence, that we start to have those conversations in our community about gender justice that are about allowing women um, or demanding that women have control over their finances and their documents, about um, demanding that women um, understand their healthcare decisions and be an active role, part of that. So I think there are all of these things. I mean, those two examples are individual, but I think um, you know we can take them on a broader scale as well and um, use those two avenues and, and also immigration and so many others to, um, to start that conversation. Well, one of the things I think we need to also kind of work on is addressing the fact that um, we ask a lot of our community, but we're not giving our community tools. We talk about having healthy relationships. We talk about how we raise boys, but we don't really have a curriculum and, and a way to kind of do that. And so I think we have a large expectation of our community on how to do certain things and how to talk to your kids about sexual assault and sex and healthy sexuality, but yet there aren't a lot of tools out there for us to do it within our community context. And, and part of the, you know, that's where the storytelling and the conversations with our community, it may not always go the way we want it, but you know, like we engage in some conversations with young women in our community and some were somewhat close, some were volunteers just to see how they looked at sexual assault. Would they even go to their parents if they were assaulted? Would they know what to do and where they're getting information? And of course, that kind of led us into having some conversation with parents of like, have you talked to your kids about assault? Mm -hmm. Like what they would do? Have you talked to your kids about sex? And some have and some haven't, but some just don't know where to start. Mm -hmm. And so part of our work has to look at giving our community tools to create the community we want to see, right? We, we want it, we put it out there, but we don't give folks tools on how to do it. And I think that's also part of our conversation of like, are we creating spaces for people to have these conversations and giving them what they need to be able to act on it? If we grew, if we grew our community's power to take on gender yeah. justice more centrally, um, I have two, two parts, uh, but all of you can answer. But the <laughs> first part is, I, I don't want to, so one of them is, let's say we built our community power to the, to the extent that our community wanted to be very active in VAWA 2018. Yeah. 
and they, they made you be the point person <laughs> uh, <laughs> in recompense for all your struggles. <laughs> what would be, what would your, <laughs> what would, so I want to ask the, the two leaders of the South Asian women's organizations, what would a VAWA look like that would resonate for you? And then I'd like our allied partners on this panel to talk about what you have, you, what were your experiences as you decided that you wanted a VAWA that resonated with yours? Mm -hmm. And what's it like doing this stuff inside the Beltway? Because we, us three, don't have that. And, and um, I'd like you all to kind of have a conversation. I don't want to moderate too much, but I want you guys to start and then. Oh, goodness. OK, I think I said some of my stuff really before was like the U visas. You couldn't wait piece. to, yes. <laughs> increasing the U visas, increasing who signs U visas, who certifies it, so that way there's more options for survivors to access it. So if you have a police department that won't sign off, can you get somebody else to sign off that, um, that you're working with? And I know there are some folks that you can, but really explaining who can sign off on it um, and making, or some other type of relief, including relief for you know, spouses on student visas. You know, um, so there's many different, I think, looking at immigration at a deeper level and providing more options and economic viability for survivors while they're waiting for the immigration status to come in is really important. Increased language, access. I mean, we, we say law enforcement, if you do X, Y, Z, but do we really have the funding for the interpreters? Like in parts of rural Georgia, you're not going to have access to interpretation. There's not the funding to do it. So how do we have the funding back up what we want? If we want more language access, we want more bilingual um, mental health service providers and caseworkers, then we have to fund it and we have to prioritize that. That's really important. Um, I think redefining the definition of what abuse is. I think we, you know, Manju had mentioned forced marriage, so being able to have that definition in and provide some remedies for us to include that in temporary protective orders or accessing legal services. So like having access to custody, I mean, the, the post-custody, if it's not part of a divorce and the TPO, having access to kind of go back and do custody stuff is very difficult to get those legal services. So being able to have that available along with adding some of the forced marriage, like legal services around for survivors of forced marriage or folks who are potential survivors of forced marriage. Well, I know that's a big sticking point amongst our community, the South Asian women's organizations community, because we're scared of having it brought up at yeah. tables that we're not there, and then you legislate and criminalize against a definition of forced marriage that isn't right. something that resonates with us, and then people in our community, we're afraid of it going underground and afraid of it actually hurting our community. Exactly. And so that's been a real um, internal conversation that we've been having about like what's our stance. So yeah. it's also the, the loaded question of like, you want to be have everything, certain things included, but not unless you can make sure that it's. That we do it responsibly, like the unintended consequences. We, like, you know, I don't think we intended for survivors, like with some of the immigration stuff, we intended for survivors to end up in immigration. You know, right. and then we have to have these memos to protect them. So there's a lot of unintended consequences where survivors end up in immigration um, and deportation proceedings and et cetera, et cetera. So really thinking about, can we do this work with community? And again, it's building our power. If we inform people and provide them with education, can we make a difference, right? As opposed to criminalizing folks, putting them in jail. And, and the consequences for many of our communities with criminalizing stuff is deportation. So then we're hurting families yet again. So really being able to do a thoughtful process of how we do this work and create safety in our communities that, you know, I mean, what I would just add to that is the issues around um, increasing civil legal remedies and really having more um, resources put toward um, legal services, especially around custody, visitation. Um, for a number of our clients, that's how they continue to get abused. Even in situations where they have um, gotten a divorce, it doesn't end with that. Sometimes it's just the beginning even, right? Because um, we had a, one client whose um, ex-husband, um, she had moved to Florida with her children and her husband was in California and he kept bringing um, you know, different motions related to visitation and custody, and he had a, um, a judge who is you know, a pro you know, dads and um, re really favorable judge on his side. And so he elongated that process quite a bit, and it was difficult for her to keep flying out from Florida to be at the, the various hearings, and no legal aid office would touch the case. Similarly around, um, you know, uh, child support and some of those issues, it's very, very difficult for 
um, legal aid organizations to take on some of those cases um, and even some of the divorce cases as well. So I would say really as we're looking forward um, to the reauthorization of VAWA, looking at putting more resources um, toward that assistance. Oh, and the immigrant, I mean the abandonment. We've had so many yeah. survivors who've been abandoned back home or their children have been kidnapped back home and being able to add those pieces because a lot of times they'll just go home for a visit and then the paperwork wasn't re-signed and then they can't come back to the United States. And then how do they fund that? And they might be separated from their children. So adding in some of those international components would be really powerful and helpful for a lot of survivors we work with. So I'm sure you've heard similar conversations in, in back five years before the last reauthorization, which is I think yeah. the starting point for where you guys decided to make VAWA resonate for you. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because so where I'm listening and I'm thinking like, oh yeah, and then it could do this and then it could do that. And I realized, you know, the first question we had to ask ourselves is what's our target here? And VAWA was one of the first things that came to mind because it's sort of the most obvious response nationally to intimate partner and sexual violence. But it is very, hev it is very heavily dependent on law enforcement and for all of the reasons that we've sort of talked about that's not necessarily the response that um, we need in LGBT communities and I think in many marginalized communities. And so it wasn't an automatic decision for us that it was VAWA, um, but we, you know, my organization runs a national coalition of anti-violence programs. We went to all of the members and said, what would you want us to work on? And I frankly think because it was one of the more recognizable already um, sort of out there pieces of legislation, folks felt like that was a good place to put our energy. But we first had to have that discussion, is, is this where we put our energy? And then I think we had to look around and see where our allies were. And you know, frankly, within the LGBT movement, um, some of the national LGBT orgs really didn't want to have anything to do with us for the first couple of years. Um, because again, we were talking about an unpopular issue that was flying in the face of marriage equality. And um, it was really difficult. And, we had to look, we, we live in that sort of, we are the domestic violence, sexual violence people in the LGBT world, and we are the LGBT people in the domestic violence, sexual violence world, right? So we looked mm -hmm. to, the, to the IPV, SV world, and you know, there's, there is this task force, there are some folks in the room from it, the National Task Force and Sexual and Domestic Violence Against Women, and um, these are the folks who have moved policy in D.C. for years and years, I mean, since before VAWA was VAWA. Um, and we weren't in the Beltway. We weren't in D.C., so we had to assess our capacity and who we could work with and how we could help out. And once we decided it was VAWA, once we saw that we weren't going to get as much help from the national LGBT orgs that are in D.C. that we thought, you know, that we, that we needed, um, and, and once we saw that the National Task Force was really the, the force Moving forward, we started to make alliances with folks in the National Task Force and, and really starting to talk about how LGBT issues are um, violence against women issues, despite the, the misnomer um, in the title for our communities. Mm. And, and it, you know, it's not an easy conversation. It's, it's not, and it's certainly not easy when you're not, we're not a predominantly, we're not a DC organization, we're not a predominantly legislative advocacy organization. You know, it's like sort of me going down to DC on Amtrak three times a week to, to try and figure it out. Um, that's a lot of capacity and a lot of resources. And I think you have to know that you have those things for, for a few years before you can even start the, the conversation with folks, right? And for us, our goal was to raise awareness around LGBT issues for the 2010 reauthorization, which is when VAWA was supposed to be reauthorized. We didn't expect to have any sort of legislative victories or, or even really have any, um, have even a lot of traction. We just thought, let's build relationships, let's get to know people, let's assess the issue, let's get familiar with the culture, and let, then let's see what happens in 2015. And you know, for a number of reasons that are too complex to go into here, 2010 turned into 11, turned into 12, <laughs> turned into 13, and we ended up getting the kind of traction, and in large part because our allies in the National Task Force decided LGBT issues were their issues, and they were willing to say the words everywhere they went, even if we weren't in the room with them, and that made a huge difference. But it, you know, we didn't wake up one morning and think like, oh, VAWA is the panacea for all that is wrong in the LGBT anti-violence movement. <laughs> like it just, it became sort of one foot after another kind of stra strategy, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm.
In fact, I think during that last reauthorization, at least for um, marginalized communities of women of color, like there were iterations of VAWA that were very hostile, that tried to erode mm -hmm. protections. And so you managed to do that with help of allies in the face of all that. Well, yeah, and I mean, if you, if you listen to the sort of rhetoric of VAWA, especially in 12 and, and the very, very beginnings of 13, people would talk about the Violence Against Women Act and the House, was, the House version, and Ron, forgive me for uh, calling out the House on this, um, was for, uh, I can't remember the language they used, it was like regular victims or real victims or something like that. Real, real victims, victims, right? Uh -huh. Which were not people of color, were not LGBT people, were not immigrants, were not native people, right? So real victims were, you know, so we had a very clear and close alliance with native groups, with immigrant groups, with communities of color, not just because LGBT folks are also native of color and immigrants, but because we were facing similar attacks from um, the more conservative uh, places in, in Congress. And, and because we knew that we wouldn't, we were only as strong as we were together, right? Like the divide and conquer tactic is a very effective one. And so we constantly had to sort of gird against that and have conversations with each other. Like they, you know, this, this person just called me. Did they call you? Because if they didn't call you, they're calling me because they're gonna try and get me to trade something for you. And so you were doing that overlay on top of all of your sort of, uh, you know, strategy just to get regular you know legislation passed it was really we all needed each other i think although certainly we needed the lgbt communities needed some folks more than they needed us for sure right yeah um how do you get congress to listen how do you get how do you get this stuff what's your perspective it's hard i think um there's a couple things i mean one is just looking for opportunities and being in you know being nimble enough to react quickly when there's a new <coughs> cycle or you know using an issue to piggyback on another issue right we know um ecap we've done work more recently talking about the connection with vawa and gun safety and guns and, and sort of tying tying things together and marrying them up in a way that maybe gets at a, a whole new group of people that are interested to an issue um it's it's a lot of work i mean i think that a lot happens at the grassroots in, in creating demand for these issues in, you know, a member in the House, in their district, and making it really personal and really local, and visiting their ed boards, and, you know, hanging out at their churches or congregations, and that, um, I think, puts a different type of pressure on lawmakers. And so, I don't know, I think it's kind of, there's, there's lots of ways to do it, but I think if you are, you see opportunities in the news, and you're kind of nimble reacting to them, if you can tie things together with members, you know, at what they feel in D.C., they're hearing about it at home. Mm -hmm. And then just the, you know, which I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about, but, you know, the grassroots effort on some of these issues and how, um, you know, leveraging different groups and, and different kind of surrogates to really move things I at the, we'll at the state now, and local and the state and local level. And I think that, you know, I think for... Um, for some of these really hard issues, there's not a natural kind of sparkly surrogate that's out there talking about these things every day. And that, you know, can sometimes um, bring visibility. And so I think there's, you know, a use of surrogates and messengers, um, even unlikely messengers, you know, men talking about the mess, right? Just the different folks that can, that can help move things at a local level. Yes. Sorry, had a no, yeah. breath. It was just, um, like I know, like within the South Asian, many of the South Asian women's organizations, like there was a fear in talking to our politicians because it would be seen as lobbying, and so a lot of the boards and stuff were kind of like nervous, yeah. nervous yeah. about like if you do this and you educate on this and this, is it considered lobbying? And so there's a lot of fear within organizations to do this work based on that fear. And I know that's been something that a lot I've heard within a lot of the South Asian women's organizations is that fear of like. How do we build that power? How do we create a voice? Is it going to be considered lobbying, and is it going to have a ne negative impact on our nonprofit? And so I think right. that's just right. And figuring out what the, the what the educational level is and what you know, uh, the nonpartisan, bipartisan way to go about it. Yeah. Right. Sharon, you said that you know, and this is like obvious. So you have queer people who are native, who are of color, who are immigrant. What, but yet you wanted to be at the table as explicitly LGBT. Mm -hmm. 
right? Why was it so important? Because I feel like a lot of times we get, South Asian women's organizations get that, well, you're an immigrant of color, mm -hmm. we're addressing women of color, just, and just, issues. and immigration issues, just, just yeah. let, just let it, you know, you're already, you're already involved, so why, why do you want to have a, why are you advocating or why are you saying that there's more that needs to be done, you need to listen to us, and what, what was it so important for you to be there? Well, I mean, I think part of it was the way that this country uh, creates an illegal status for LGBT mm -hmm. folks, right? So we can't get married, we don't have relationships mm. with our kids, um, or those can be threatened really easily. We can be fired just for being gay or uh, lesbian, bisexual, transgender. Um, we could lose our housing. Uh, you know, there are so many reasons that uh, it, it is unlawful to be LGBT in this country that, you know, being an immigrant or being native or being of color, and if there are protections in those identities, they don't trump the unlawfulness of being LGBT, right, in this country. And so, and remember, like 2008, this was, you know, sort of before um, marriage happened in most places. And marriage, P.S., is not also not a panacea. Like it doesn't solve all of our problems. What is it? <laughs> Shockingly, <laughs> no. Um, but it does start to turn the tide of are you a lawful person in this country or are you an unlawful person in this country, right? Um, and so w I think we needed to be there because we saw very specific issues. One of the things that we heard about, because it, wa you know, it wasn't like we, we said, oh, we're LGBT communities and we would like to be a part of VAWA. And everyone said, oh, great, come on in, right? I mean, we had to like negotiate that. And, you know, and we were talking earlier, like part of that is there is sometimes a perception that the pie is only so big. And yeah. if you add another community, the pie doesn't, can't support it. Um, but part of it too is like, oh no, don't worry, we got you, we got you, you know? And, and the, there was some strength to that argument. Mm. The Obama administration had indicated it would be more LGBT friendly um, than the Bush administration and there might be administrative remedies and there might be things that we could do that weren't legislative and this Congress was gonna be a really hostile Congress for LGBT folks. And so we said, okay, great, we're gonna do that too, mm -hmm. right? So we pursued an administrative path and a legislative path at exactly the same time because we couldn't trust that either one was going to be enough for us. And we happened to get lucky, again, for, for reasons that had to do with our advocacy and didn't have to do with our advocacy. Um, but we saw a very specific place where our identities were not only not protected, um, but in some cases, state administrators were telling us, like, we can't fund LGBT programs because our state doesn't allow us to fund LGBT wow. programs generally, yeah. and so we can't use VAWA. So the fact that like VAWA was silent as to LGBT issues was helpful in states where they wanted to fund LGBT programs, and it was unhelpful in states where they didn't want to. And so we really saw the need to have to clarify that in order to protect LGBT folks. Um, yeah, so there was Thank you, no, that's that. great. Um, so before I open it for questioning, this has been at least, so this is API Heritage Month, and this is actually um, the first time that a group of the South Asian women's organizations have worked together in an official coalition, and we develop, develop where we are developing shared statements, p position statements on where we stand on certain issues. So it's a, a watershed moment, really, and so I just wanted to allow the panel to close with the two representatives of that coalition of what, what gender justice means. Like what, and we're here this week, you know, for a whole bunch of activities, and we're working with allies like NCAPA and SALT and, and KPAC and, and the White House Initiative to get our voices more uh, heard. What's your vision for the future and for gender justice? It's been a long road, right? Where do you see it going? Oh, hold on, make me a second. Um, where do I see it going? Wow. Increased funding. So all of Sal Woes, our always an executive director, is going to be like money. <laughs> Aspirational. <laughs> Let's be aspir that too. That's I mean, enough funding so that we can continue to do the work the way we want to do it, not based on guidelines, but we can do the work in our community so we can build that power, change attitudes, and really kind of like shift how we're doing our work so our community owns this work. I mean, if you're talking aspirational, you know, yeah. that's how I'd love to see it, see it go, is that we're all owning this issue, we're talking about it, we're not afraid, we're creating tools that are like groundbreaking and, <laughs> you know, and that we have the immigration relief that we need and that we're also looking at the economics, that we're tying in all the intersections mm 
I mean, because like the passing of DOMA and adding LGBT has ha benefited so many of my friends. So that we're looking at the entire intersections, so that any survivor can access what they need and not be fear and not feel like there's an un level. I mean, that there's a level playing field for them to access. Because right now it's not a level playing field for survivors, mm -hmm. depending on how you identify. So that's my aspirational goal. Thank you. So I would say my aspirational goal is about really engaging um, members of the community. And I think um, as we're talking about South Asian women's organizations, engaging women. Um, and for us, that also means young women. And um, we recently started a leadership development program for young professional women in the South Asian community, um, whom, by the way, a number of them are themselves survivors of domestic violence because their fathers, their uncles, um, other people in their family have been batterers, and so they've seen it up close and personal. Um, and so, you know, it makes it even more challenging for them to then play a leadership role in their communities, whatever community it might be. It might be a community of physicians or lawyers. It may be in a, their community at the mosque or the temple. It may be um, their ethnic community. Um, but we started that in part because we want it to not just be about um, reacting to what's happening um, and just providing direct services. I mean, for us at SAN, it really is, um, in addition to the advocacy that we're all doing, is to build that power. Mm -hmm. Um, and to claim the power that we have as a community. A shout out to Salt and to Suman <laughs> back there. Um, but, um, and there is so much leadership potential, I think, in the community once we start to address um, whether it's sexual assault, domestic violence, some of these other um, gender issues, son preference, um, uh, you know, coerced marriage, even if it's not forced marriage. And I think, um, you know, we're doing it, you know, eight to 10 women at a time, but I think our hope is that we are then developing that next group of leaders and so that um, there's, um, that women are standing in line ready to serve. Um, hopefully we'll also have some that are in Congress, that are in uh, their local PTAs, uh, in the city council as well. And so that to me is the aspirational goal and why we're here this week is because we want to create that foundation for them. Thank you. Well, I am going to conclude this panel. Thank you, everyone, for um, sharing your perspectives and, and, and thoughts. And now I'm going to open up to questions from the audience. If any of you have any questions, questions, coffee needed? Ah, yes. And please wait for the mic because we're live streaming this. So. Good afternoon, Thank everyone. Uh, one of the things that I'm going to ask is that, uh, you know, too often for the last four or five years as I've worked on VAWA, and Sharon knows I just retired from the House Judiciary Committee, I've been the only man in the room. Mm -hmm. That has to change. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it okay? Yeah, yeah. It really has to change. <laughs> Are you Where? the only? Uh, uh, no, no, you're not. You're not. <laughs> All right, bro. <laughs> but this conversation, this issue, is not a woman's issue. Mm. It's, it's everybody's issue. Mm -hmm. And we need to change that perception. We talked about grassroots, and that's very important. I would tell the folks I met with, I would remind them that all politics is local. And you've got to start grassroots. Mm -hmm. You want to walk the halls of the House of, of, of Congress? That's great but also make sure that their constituents know what they're doing, that you educate their constituents so that their constituents can tell their members, their representatives, what needs to be done. Great example I'll give you. In the 112th Congress, the House Republican bill was named after freshman Congresswoman Sandy Adams from Orlando. She allowed the Republicans to use her name. And yet a Catholic nun from her district wrote a scathing op-ed. Sharon, I don't know if you remember that. Mm -hmm. That just criticized Sandy Adams, said, how could you do this? Mm 
You yourself were a victim of domestic violence. You yourself were a police officer who responded to domestic violence calls. How could you allow your name to be placed on this bill? Sandy Adams lost her reelection bid because her constituents learned what she was doing. Mm. So we've got to do this. We've got to educate the community. On immigration, we are woefully ignorant on issues of immigration. We don't get it. We don't understand it. And it's incumbent upon us to educate not just the elected officials, but the community at large, because they don't know. And if they don't know, they can't be your supporters. Mm. Sharon was absolutely right. Everybody who advocated for VAWA 2013 came on board, supporting LGBT, supporting uh, tribal women, supporting the refusal to roll back protections for immigrant women. And everyone refused to be divided. Mm. And trust me, the Republicans, they made numerous attempts, but they failed because there was that commitment. Thank you. Thank you. Does, does anyone want to say anything about that? Other than thank you. <laughs> well said. Well said. Agree. We agree. Yes. <laughs> the panel agrees. Hi, I'm actually here on behalf of the Asian American Pacific Islander uh, Commission and, or Presidential Commission. And, you know, it looks like you guys have, well, you, I say you, but it's really all of us. Um, in my real life, I'm the executive director of Asian Family Support Services in Austin. And what you guys had brought up earlier about these three levels of, if you want to call it, access to power whether it's the legislative route, the administrative route, or even within your own state administration. Um, so a, a lot of things that you've said are very wonderful things that I'll bring back to the commission. But one thought I had while you were speaking about being in Georgia and me being in <laughs> Texas, you know, um, I do think that when it comes to the state coalitions, there, something needs to happen within the Department of Justice during the time when we're allocating funds to state coalitions, that there needs to be a strong emphasis to include our culturally specific programs in there. And I'd love to continue that conversation because it happens on the local level. We can have wonderful legislative stuff put in there but if our states are stopping it yes. um it definitely doesn't help us because you talked earlier about legal recourses and that's all state statutes mm -hmm. so so i think there's some some conversations to be had around how can we get that ovw funding to either put in some teeth yeah. around state coalitions and how they conduct their activities and uh, and I don't think it's just the state coalitions, it's also our state administrators and, and our, I'm going to say, our politicians who are elected who make those decisions because we've had it, our administrators try to do really good stuff and our politicians have actually over, I guess, overpowered it and, and taken money away from certain groups, you know, like the LGBT groups or even some immigrant groups. So it's challenging. So we can try and build that power. But there's also repercussions to our daily work that sometimes happens. And I think working in the South, there's a different reality of how that impacts us and how it, you know, when you're the only organization doing that work in your community, like you can try and push it, but there's also, when you've seen the repercussions where people's funding gets cut because they're taking a stand, it's pretty scary because that means your voice could totally go away like that, mm -hmm. you know. So I think it's also understanding our communities, like what you can do in D.C., what is not the same thing that we can do in Georgia or in Texas or even some of the Carolinas or in the South. So really keeping that in mind. So it's easy to say, build up that power, people are going to care. But some of these folks elected these politicians who have like really had some serious, I mean, have taken revenge out on certain organizations when they've taken that stand. But on the flip side, what Linda is also saying is that um, those are places for us to be in. 
-hmm. Right, and we have to have the teeth. Like the thing is we can complain about it and, and I've seen our coalition bring in DOJ, but there's not a lot of teeth and there's not a lot of ways to kind of push some stuff. We try, but there's not as much teeth as we would really need to make sure that there's that accountability that our communities need and deserve. Yeah. <laughs> um, any more questions? Hi, uh, I represent Asha. It's Asha for Women. We are in the local area. Both of us are from Asha. I have a question regarding the stigma attached to the men. So when you do the community outreach, do you have many men come in and help the male of the species, and just the domestic violence? Because we find that to be a really hard thing to get the male to take part in any kind of an outreach. Um, as our organization, we've always had men active in our community and have been willing to help out and volunteer in some, some, some shape or form. We've had men on our board of directors. So we've actually had men that have been engaged that have wanted to do the work. So we, I mean, there, I think there's, there's this whole thing of like, also making sure they have the training that they do it because sometimes they think they already know everything and they don't have to go through the training and that's part of where we have to do some work but there's also some men who've come in with open hearts and open minds and wanting to really make change and so it's more us having support but we have had men that have helped out and we have men who are engaged. What I'd like to add um, is two things. Um, if actually Saima could get the mic over there so she could answer on behalf of San. But one thing I want to say also, she's our deputy director, um, is just in addition to having men work with the organization, I think it's important that, I mean, I feel like we've seen a real shift in men in the audience and their responses, and I want to bring, raise that too, which is I think that a lot of times now we are having very supportive men. We've had, um, and actually Simon can speak to this too, we've had trainings for um, imams, for religious leaders in the Hindu temples, at the Gurudwaras, and so getting them to help champion what we do is important, and also their congregants. So, Saima, if you could really address some of that key work that we've been doing. Yeah, I mean, I can try. I mean, so, um, I mean, I think you're right. Like, it is it is difficult, and, you know, this is something that San's been working on for, you know, 20-odd years, and, and, and it's changed, right? So, so I guess one tip is just to keep doing it, right? And, and to keep having those difficult conversations that the panel has been talking about. Um, but, you know, something that we've really tried to do over the years is really have partnerships with each of the religious spaces, and to really Really partner with the religious leaders at the gurdwaras, at the churches, at the temples, at the um, mosques. I mean, that means sort of reading up on our religion, right? It means you know, like sort of being a quote unquote like pseudo expert on um, on some of those things. It means partnering with researchers who can give us a lot of that data, so that when we go to the temple, I can say the right things, right? Like um, I can use their language and you know, to sort of get them to buy in. Um, but you know, but I think um, I think it's changing. Um, we've had more and more sort of success with the religious leaders and, and just, you know, um, other men in the community in general, especially um, strange, you know, not, not strangely, but perhaps surprisingly, um, you know, so many of the older sort of granddads and uncles are bringing in survivors, um, not necessarily their daughters, mm -hmm. but their friends' daughters or their cousins, you know, th their nieces and things like that. And so, so really looking out for, um, and I think that's also, you know, unfortunately, sometimes it, it takes that individual and personal impact to get people to see what's been happening for years. Um, they might not notice that domestic violence has been happening, you know, for years, and then when it happens to someone close to them. Um, and so, so it's really about when that happens also, how can we build those relationships with those men and really um, you know, have them be leaders and spokes folks in our community to keep having that relationship with them, not just to bring that one person in, but to keep having a long-term relationship with them. Right, so the year... No, they're not necessarily. The, so they're they're bringing in um, a survivor for sub, for help and support. Um, you know, so yeah, and and of course the other leaders are sort of broader sort of community and religious leaders in the community. Yeah. Um, is there, so and I I'm not sure if I misunderstood your question, but one of the things we talk a lot about in the LGBT communities is how to work with people who are abusive, right? Because if if we are already marginalized as a community, and if we, for lots and lots of different reasons, don't want to call the police or use law enforcement, 
the solution can't be like, oh, okay, I guess we'll just live with the fact that some people are violent, right? Like that, that can't be, so, right? So, so, so then you have to start to look at what does community accountability mean, right? And, and what does it mean to hold people accountable outside of a, a sort of traditional law enforcement system? Um, and I don't think we've gotten there yet as, as the LGBT communities. I'm not sure that I've seen any community actually get there. But certainly, I think marginalized communities have done a lot more work to try and get there because it's in our interests to be there, right? And I think part of what we're finding is that it's hard to have the language to have the conversation about how you're trying to do this without being sort of a traitor to the and you know the anti-domestic violence movement because how dare you and you know all of that and and really trying to find community to have that conversation to then try and figure out. And it means being nuanced about things, right? Like there are different types of violence. There are different motivations for being violent. There are different ways that you can reach people. And there are some people you will never reach and they will just be the violent people mm -hmm. in your communities. And I think that's where I would say, so I'm not sure VAWA is like the perfect response to that, right? It's not what the legislation is set up to do. The legislation was set up to bring in the law enforcement community and to raise awareness because 30 years ago, we didn't do that, right? And, and so that was really important. But I, I, we're, we're starting to have this like, but what's next conversation? And we don't, we don't, it's not, we don't have the language. We certainly don't have the legislation or the funding or, but, we have some political will, and there are some people who are really interested in having these conversations in places that you wouldn't expect. Like in, in New York City, the Manhattan DA's office is interested in having this conversation, which is like the oddest sort of partnership that you would think about. But also there have been marginalized communities for years that have been having these conversations and developing these strategies, and we're making alliances with folks who have been doing that. And so I think that's a different, that's also like, I love this idea that like, there are men in the community who will bring in survivors because they're in a place where they can do that. And I, I actually yeah. leaned over to Taloma and I was like, so that's a strategy, <laughs> right? Yeah. But, but then there are also like, to a certain extent, you can't eat your own, right? Like you can't just kick everybody out of the community because then you don't have a community anymore. And so what are the alternatives? And, and I don't have any answers. I just am asking a lot of the, those questions. But I but feel like VAWA has changed and adapted. It's not just law enforcement. I mean, the culturally specific funding does allow for us to do a lot more community work and adapt based on our community. And the same with the engaging men work, right? So there, there is funding. And VAWA has been adapting to address community-related stuff. It's not just law enforcement. You know, there, there are pieces that are about engaging men and engaging boys and, you, you know, um, so also keeping in mind that there are community aspects of it. I mean, I'm not, it's not the end all be all. <laughs> it is not, but I'm really proud of how it's shifting and looking at community and knowing that some of our communities are going to address this issue in a very different way. Mm -hmm. um, but also we have to keep being in our community. We have to keep having those conversations. We have to include and come up with strategies that are true and real for our own communities and providing that space for men to actually be able to be active and provide that training and mentorship, you know, and having more men that come in and mentor that. Like I have uncles who told me a story of like there was a situation in their own community where they actually went and addressed the abusive husband themselves. And they're very proud of this. They tell me the story, they're like, we did our own little piece and we haven't heard of any abuse, you know? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, being able to give tools to our community so we can come up with a solution so we're not always having, because we know not everybody's gonna use a criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. I think that's key of like engaging men and working in community is making sure people realize that gender-based violence in our communities is not just this women's issue, that women's work and women's time on the side, that it's centered and yeah. that whether you are uh, an organization working on civil liberties or on economic justice, that there's that gender piece to it and that our work is your work as well yeah. and that we work across movements and across our eyes. And so. we'll all benefit from each other's Absolutely. work. So mm -hmm. like, you know, like I said. And then no Republicans can divide us when it comes down <laughs> to that, <laughs> that time. New America Foundation is nonpartisan, <coughs> probably nonpartisan. Yeah. I just feel like I should say that. Um, Thank you all for your time and for your attention. And thank you so much to our brilliant panelists for your time and your attention. <laughs> um, this concludes this session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.